Today we'll focus on chapter five and we'll build up a mathematical model to describe muscle and tendon and how they interact to generate force. While the model we'll use, shown here, is simpler than real muscle, it captures many of the salient features of muscle-tendon interaction. I hope you can think about muscle like little bean guy is doing here, looking at his muscles, thinking about a hill-type model of muscle. So our plan is to first talk about neuromuscular biomechanics, how the nervous system excites and activates muscles. We'll then do a quick review of the force length and force velocity relationships. And then we'll talk about muscle architecture and how they affect the force length and force velocity relationships. We'll then talk about muscle tendon interaction. Then we'll move on to more computational aspects in the next segment. So that's the plan. We're starting with neural command of the musculoskeletal system. We've seen this familiar general framework for the class, and we'll begin with neural command, which activates muscle to generate muscle force, which acts on the skeletal system to produce moments about the joints. Those moments over time produce accelerations, velocities, and, and positions. So what I wanna to do today is focus on activation to see what's happening with your nervous system on its way to generating muscle forces. So the key points that we'll cover are these. First, muscle activation, getting from the nerve to muscle. Second, rate encoding of muscle force. That is, one of the key things we need to be able to do in coordination and control of movement is to modulate our muscle force to make it from small or big. We really have two ways to do that. One is rate encoding to modulate force. The second is motor unit recruitment to modulate muscle force. We'll finish up this section with a description of electromyography, or EMG, which we use to estimate muscle forces. Okay, so let's talk first about neuromuscular organization. A fundamental unit of the neuromuscular system is the motor unit. And what a motor unit is, it's a motor neuron that is a motor nerve and all of the fibers that that motor neuron innervates. And my brother David drew this cartoon where you can see in the spinal cord, there are a set of motor neuron cells, and they send projections out to a set of muscle fibers. So you see we've encoded just three, a red one, a blue one, and an orange one. So how do we get from a motor neuron out to muscle force? One of the things that we know is that there's a ratio of how many fibers per motor neuron. Some are small, some are large. So for example, in some muscles, you might have very fine motor control, so you have just a few fibers for each motor neuron. In other muscles, there are many muscle fibers, so you can get a lot of force, but you can't control it very well. Let's see how that works. The way that we get a signal from a nerve to muscle is at the neuromuscular junction. Now, the neuromuscular junction is exactly what it sounds like, a junction that connects the neural side of things with the muscle side of things. You can see that we have a motor neuron connecting at what we call a synapse on the muscle fiber. If we zoom in, like I'm showing here, you can see that synapse. And in this synapse, when the nerve action potential courses down, reaches the neuromuscular junction, there's a release of a chemical called acetylcholine that activates a sequence of actions within the muscle that lead to that muscle being activated. Now, there are a whole sequence of things, but in the end, calcium ions are released that allow the cross bridges to form, specifically at the binding sites of actin and myosin, as we've discussed last time. So that's the big picture here. An interesting side note is that when you inject 
botulinum toxin, usually people know this as Botox, what it does is it blocks the release of that acetylcholine, essentially paralyzing your muscle. That's what happens when you inject botulinum toxin into your muscle. It essentially paralyzes the muscle. Um, that can be good if the muscle's spastic and you're trying to reduce the spasticity. People typically do it into their face that makes your face smooth and relatively lifeless. Okay, so that's the neuromuscular junction. I mentioned there are two ways to modulate force with frequency of stimulation and motor unit recruitment. So we're gonna go through these in some detail. Let's start first with this simple experiment called a twitch experiment. Let's look at this top line here. S1 is when the first shock is delivered. When that shock is delivered, after a small delay, you get a twitch in muscle force. If the second shock occurs, let's say two seconds later, you get an identical twitch in muscle force. Now let's take another scenario where they're not separated by two seconds, they're closer than that. So here you get a first twitch and a second twitch. Not so separated. If they're even closer, so S1 and S2 here, you start to get superposition. So why does this happen? There's a dynamic associated with the buildup of muscle force and the decay of muscle force. And if the muscle motor unit hasn't decayed and you give it a second shock, you'll get a superposition of the force. So let's talk about twitch and tetanus. We've just discussed twitch. And what I'm showing here, again, is a force time trace at a relatively low frequency, five hertz, a higher frequency, 10 hertz, 20 hertz, and then 40, 80, and 100 hertz. So what you see at these lower frequencies, you get a, a lower force that's twitchy. Even at 20 hertz here, with a synchronous stimulation like this, you get a wobbly version of the muscle force. Once you go above that, it's smooth, and that's called a fused tetanus. We all get tetanus shots when we're born. That's to uh, prevent the problem of tetanus where all your muscles are contracting very intensely, which is obviously life-threatening. So the nervous system produces movement by modulating force. One way we do this is through the change of frequency. You see that there's low frequency here, higher frequency here, we get a difference in force. We wanna do that, for example, by, you wanna use the same muscles in your fingers, for example, to peel a grape. So you need very small forces and very fine control. But if I'm gonna use those same muscles to play a Rachmaninoff piano concerto, it's the same muscles that need now to produce very large forces at my fingertip. One of the ways to do that is by changing the stimulation frequency. Let's look at another example. Let's say, take my quadriceps. If I'm just standing here, I need a little bit of force in my quadriceps, but not much. But if I wanted to do a maximum height jump, which for me is on the order of 3.4 centimeters, then you need to generate a lot of force in your quadriceps. Changing frequency of stimulation is one way to do this. Do you think this is a very good way to modulate muscle force? Not so good. Uh, you can see we don't get a very big range of force, only about a factor of four. And when we're doing it at low forces, it's relatively twitchy, and so you'd end up with a tremor. So we need a second way to modulate force, which I'll show you now. The second way is by a change in recruitment. It's a beautiful thing that your nervous system does automatically, this process of orderly recruitment. And by orderly, what I mean is that the smallest, most fatigue resistant motor units are recruited first. Why is this an advantage? If we are trying to produce very small forces, then we wanna be able to change them at very fine grades. So producing a small amount of force with small motor units first is key. The other thing is these small motor units are resistant to fatigue. In 1965, 
a scientist named Elwood Henneman first discovered this orderly recruitment of motor units and described the size principle where small amounts of force are generated first in small un motor units that are resistant to fatigue. Then when you want larger forces, you get larger motor units come into play and generate force. So it's a beautiful system. Now, if you stimulate muscle with an external stimulator, you don't get this beautiful orderly recruitment. In fact, you get the big motor units first and they tend to be fatigable. So that's one of the problems with using external stimulation to produce muscle force. So that's the orderly recruitment. And this is an excellent way to increase muscle forces. Let's dive into this in just a little bit more detail in this diagram. So here again is the spinal cord I showed. And now let's say we are recruiting a low level of muscle force. So we have these small motor units. They have a low threshold, the blue motor units here. So let's say I just want a small force in my fingertip. I'm just gonna recruit the blue motor units. They reach a threshold of stimulation. So they go from no um, motor units excited here to these fibers now highlighted in blue, they've reached their threshold and they're generating force. Now let's say we've increased the level of activation to a muscle and we get additional motor units active. We've reached this orange threshold now. Now we're getting all of these orange motor units coming into the force generating enterprise. And now we reach a higher threshold, more activation, and now we're getting all of the muscle fibers engaged in the force generating enterprise. So this is the primary way that we modulate force during movement is by recruiting first small motor units and then larger motor units and then the largest motor units. This way we get fine motor control at low levels of force and still can generate very high forces for uh, short durations. We can estimate how much force is being generated with an electromyographic signal. If I put electrodes on a muscle or in a muscle, I get this raw electromyographic signal that I'm showing here. Just a squiggle back and forth. It's a noisy signal. I process this signal to try to get a better feel for what activation is. The first thing I do is I rectify the signal. By that I mean I take the positive and negative values and I make them all positive. I then low pass filter this signal here. So here's the, my filtered EMG signal. So now I have a number that is between zero and one that gives me a sense of if the muscle's on or not. When it's not on, we don't get an EMG signal or we get a very small EMG signal, we call that a zero. And when it's maximally excited, I get a signal that is maximum and I'll call that one. We can elicit a maximum contraction in the lab, for example, if I have EMG electrodes on my biceps here and I have uh, a, someone holding back and encouraging me to go, max out, come on, pull, pull, then you can generate an EMG signal that's a max, you call that one. You record it during rest, you call that zero, and you can estimate then the activation in muscle from zero to one and how that varies over time. So just a couple key takeaways from this section. One, we have two ways to modulate force, rate encoding and recruitment, where recruitment is really the primary mechanism. Second, orderly recruitment allows fine motor control and fatigue resistance at low levels of force, but then allows us to generate large forces for a short duration when they're needed. Finally, surface electromyographic recordings or EMG provide a method to estimate the timing and level of activation of muscles. Okay, we've talked about neuromuscular biomechanics. We're going to move on next to some of the basic review of force length and force velocity problems.